this really is a look back at what we've done or what I did. This is a very sort of personal view over the last year and what this means for us going forward. So to start with, when we were told last year that we were going to suddenly teach everything online, it was quite a shock because I really had no experience of, I'd never tried teaching online and I didn't really know very much about it. My only exposure to teaching online had been, if we remember sort of 10 years ago when there was all this excitement about MOOCs. And at that time we had gone through and I went back and I looked at some of the headlines and this was all around 2012 when everything was supposed to be changing. Online teaching was supposed to revolutionize the world. The word revolution was thrown around a lot. And in 2012, actually, the New York Times declared that this was going to be the year of the MOOC. Now, by the end of it, we were starting to ask this dreadful question as to is this going to be the end for all of us? or are we just going to have a handful of people who are going to teach the whole world? And in, by January of 2013, Sebastian Throne, if you remember, was going to teach a course, and this was at the University of California, at California State University, San Jose State University, where they were actually going to teach a course. Of course, when they've taught the course, they discussed, this was the first year mathematics course which they taught, and a huge proportion of the class actually failed. And so they went back and they reassessed that whole thing. But by December 2013, doubts were starting to set in. And in 2014, people were wondering about this. They discovered that the universities are still standing. And finally, by the end of it, it was decided that MOOCs are dead. By 2017, MOOCs were dead. Nobody knew what online teaching meant anymore. As it seems, we had been through the whole hype cycle. We had gone all the way from inflated expectations down into disillusionment. And then COVID crashes in and suddenly, all of us are in this. And I'm hoping that maybe we are starting to crawl up that slope of enlightenment. And so it really is the time to start thinking about what have we learned. And so some of the questions I think that we need to address now are first of all, how effective has online teaching been? What did we lose? So things were, didn't all go perfect. What is it that we lost? On the other hand, there were things we discovered that we could do which we couldn't do before. So what is it that we would like to preserve going forward? And what are our new capabilities? So I'm going to try and talk about some of these things. And again, as I said, that this is a very personal view, so take it for what it's worth. But just to give you a background, so I ended up actually doing quite a lot of online teaching. So as Ian was saying, I teach, this is a big second year course taught to engineering science students on thermodynamics. And I teach the first half of it, which is the thermodynamics portion of it. I then also teach thermodynamics to the mechanical engineering students. And so this is again a big thermodynamics class. So I got quite a lot of experience over the last one year in teaching thermodynamics to big classes. Now I also teach a smaller graduate course in which I had 18 students and I'll talk about that. And finally there's a specialized course which I've been involved in and this is actually taught in, out of the University of Darmstadt in Germany, which I've been involved with for many years. And this is the first time we taught that online. So I'm going to try and talk about that as well. Okay, so 
in a typical lecture, when I used to go in and teach this in person, in a 15-minute lecture, I estimate that about 30 minutes of it would go just to give people information. And then we talk about 10 minutes for solving equations, discussion of that, answering questions. And then I'd like to throw in a little way we talk about some of the applications for this, some of the research work and so on. And this last 20 minutes is when students were actually most engaged. And so the question was, could we use the videos for the information transfer? Now, one of the advantages of recording this as a video is that it's much more compact. So what I would write on a blackboard in 30 minutes, I could probably fit into a 15 minute lecture. Okay. So this was all. So that, that, then can we go to a flipped classroom concept where we expect students to watch 15 minutes of video before the class. Now, the students then can go and replay this and they can take their time. That was the idea. And so hopefully this would be more efficient than just asking them to read a textbook. OK, so would this be better than writing on a blackboard? Now, when I made these videos, I kept it fairly simple. I used PowerPoint. And this has actually pretty good animation capabilities. I learned quite a bit about animating it on that, and I'll show you some of the examples. And you can record sound, and then you can actually present this as a movie. So I made these videos, which were typically about 10 to 15 minutes in length. And the idea was that I would try and do a flipped classroom, where I would ask the students to watch this before the lecture. And then in the lecture, I would take only about 10 minutes to review the information. And then I would spend the time in terms of doing the demonstrations, let the students do some, and spend it on the discussion. So this is what I was sort of hoping to do. Now, just to give you an example of the sort of animations. So this is one of the slides which I would do. So if you are talking about how you can use heat, to expand a gas and do useful work, or you can use the motion of the water. If you want to put a weight on it, you can get more work done out of that. Okay, you can actually do sort of equations quite nicely. So I was talking about compression, and you can show the equations. You can combine that with the animation where you're showing how you can compress a gas, how you can expand it, and you can develop the equations to show the work done. So this is sort of standard thermodynamic development, but you can see how you can speed up the process. And then you can show all sorts of other things. So for example, when you're talking about the second law of thermodynamics, you talk about processes which are reversible, this is an irreversible process. You can mix in videos. So for example, I'm trying to show an irreversible process. So this is a process which goes in one direction. And you say that this is possible. And then you show a process which is not possible. And this leads into a discussion of irreversibility. And so, for example, you can talk about things like, can you use energy from the air? So you got the air, you take the heat, use it to run a car, and you do work, and you sail off in perpetually that way. Or we want to talk about how you can use build an engine where you do work. You want to cool the gas down. And why you need. You can mix in computer simulations. So these are some nice simulations of an ideal gas. You can actually illustrate a lot of these sort of phenomena. You can actually mix in 
pictures. So this was examples of what a steam turbine looks like. You can show videos of compressors. And you can actually find pretty sophisticated animations say of like a gas turbine. Okay, so <clears throat> I made, I use these and I spent most of my last summer. So I've now got something like 50 videos. They vary from five minutes to 20 minutes. About 15 minutes is sort of like the median. That's an average video. So typically I've got one for a lecture. Some of the shorter ones, I'd expect them to watch about two of them. Now most of the students actually gave me very positive feedback. They liked this, they found it, they were easy to understand, they were a useful length. I kept a close eye on how many students were actually watching these. So I would go before each lecture, I would actually check how many students, uh, I put them up on Microsoft Stream. So unfortunately, it doesn't give you much more information except the number of views, but I wouldn't know how many students watched it. At the beginning of the lectures, when we started the course, something like 90% of the students were watching them. By the end of the lecture, it had dropped about 50%. And this is the reality that as students start getting busy, it becomes harder and harder for them to keep up. Okay, <clears throat> now, some of my other experiences, so all the exams were take home, but in a thermodynamics class, you have to have them doing uh, numerical problems. And I was reasonably satisfied that students were actually were working them alone. Like on exams, there weren't any obvious signs of like mass collaboration. The course average at the end wasn't very different from what I would expect. So, one of the things I learned is that a flipped classroom is actually quite hard to do. You know, we'd, I'd spent a lot of time looking at glowing testimonials from other people who had done this, but once you start doing this, it's harder than you would think. One of the problems is that you are now asking for an extra time commitment and students have difficulty with this because you are really to, to a one hour lecture, you are adding on typically something like half an hour before that, even for a 15 minute video, by the time they actually look at this and understand it, it's a significant time commitment. And when you go into the lecture, you're never quite sure of how many students have actually watched this, which creates problems because then I have to sort of spend more and more time trying to summarize. And the students have actually watched this and spent quite a bit of time to think that you are ending up duplicating it. So that gets a little annoying for them. On the plus side, the questions and the discussions actually were much livelier. So a significant number of the students actually had seen this and they came prepared with questions. So that was a real benefit. This gave a lot of time for broader discussions and problem solving. And this was a real benefit as an instructor, having the luxury of that extra time where you can actually solve problems and discuss these with students is a real plus. The other advantage is that students are not scrambling around. So the other, when I say that only 50% of the students were there in the synchronous lectures. I actually have no idea of how many watched that otherwise. And that is one of the things that if we are doing this, we really need to have better analytics from the videos of how many students have watched it, when have they watched it, and so on. One of the best parts of this actually is the office hours. So I would do office hours and the response was actually tremendous. One was that I could schedule them now whenever I wanted them. 
So I would have office hours at seven in the evening. I would have them on a Sunday afternoon. And I think students really appreciated the ease with which they could come in. I also discovered that I had a lot of students who actually didn't have questions, but would come to these anyway, just to listen to what other students were asking about that. And I think we got something out of that because we would have in this, you know, fairly lengthy, the students who came in prepared with questions would have pretty insightful questions. And I think the other students who were just listening as well learned a lot. So one thing I'm definitely going to do afterwards is all my office hours from now on will be online. OK, so this was for the undergraduate classes. Next is for the graduate class. And what I found was that my attendance actually was fairly low. Where I teach graduate class in person, I'm used to having about 100% attendance. And in fact, it's impossible to do the course if we don't attend the lectures because we don't have a textbook and the students really have to attend the lectures. But now since they, these are all being recorded, I think a number of the students prefer to watch the recording at times which were more convenient to them. But this really killed the discussion in class. So again, I'm used when we are in person to have a pretty lively graduate class where the students are asking questions, discussions. We're having a real conversation. Going online for a graduate class really seemed to kill that. Now, the other problem is that the students, so a lot of these were first year students who never actually been on campus, who don't know each other. And it's much harder for them to have a lively discussion if they don't know anybody else and they cannot see their faces. The dynamics really change over here. And so this becomes more difficult. Okay. And so I, it, it's surprising that I actually thought that a graduate class would be easier to do online, but it didn't turn out that way. Now, <clears throat> let me talk about this fourth class, which I was talking about. So this is a course on atomization and sprays, which is my area of research. And we've been doing this for the last five years out of the University of Darmstadt in Germany. And so this is a course where we get typically about 10 instructors from different, largely from Europe, some from North America, and we all fly down over there. It's a four day intensive course. We get students who are signing up for this and we typically cap this at about 40 students. So it's a very intensive course. Four days we go from morning till evening on a whole range of different now, this is normally a fairly expensive course because the fees for this was something of the order of almost a thousand euros, plus the students are investing four days, travel, stay, and all of that. Now, when we went online, the first thing was that our costs dropped dramatically. So we dropped the prices down. So if you were from industry, it was 250 euros, and academia was 150 euros. So all of a sudden we found that we had something like 200, almost 200 people applying for this. So we capped it at 100. And the reason we capped it is that one of the biggest values of this course is the reason the students come is that they can have in-depth discussions. So most of the people who are teaching this are experts in the field. These are the names you see on the textbooks and all the papers, and that's what attracts the students. And so they <clears throat> really value the discussions that they can have. So we capped this at 100 people. But then we decided to run the course again, and we're going to run it again in May. So we did one in February. Now we're going to do it again in May. And we did all of these lectures. So we recorded the lectures. Okay. And 
because we could do this, we could even increase the number of instructors. So we had 13 instructors from about six different countries. We had instructors we could get from both university and industry. So some of these people were from uh, working practitioners. For each course, we had about 100 students from 15 countries. So suddenly our horizon for the students expanded a lot. The students were one third from industry, but the number of them from academia, because now it suddenly became much cheaper. So we had a graduate students enrolling as well. And the experience was actually quite interesting. So we had this big increase in the enrollment. So what we did was that all of us recorded the lectures. And so the lectures, were, the recorded lectures were playing, but we were there as well. And we were monitoring the chats. So the students, while the lecture was playing, could put in questions and we would in real time answer these questions. After the lecture, we would have a breakout room. So all the students would follow you know, each instructor, the ones who were really keen on asking questions, and the discussions would go on in the breakout room. And now all of this was recorded, the, everything in the chat room. So even the students who couldn't follow the questions uh, in real time had access to them afterwards. OK, so some of the lessons learned. I would not go back to teaching full time a second year undergraduate class purely online. Because I think one of the things we really discovered is that what we do in our undergraduate, a lot of it is really socializing of the students. They need each other, most importantly, and I think we need to be with them in person as well. So this MOOC version, this sort of vision which we had 10 years ago where people would get a complete education without ever setting foot on campus, I don't think is ever going to happen. So what would I keep? Now, I have all of these PowerPoint presentations and a lot of them are actually sort of very compact and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with how they turned out. But I'm not sure that I would do a flipped classroom again. I think if I use them, I would actually use them in class. So I would take the first 10 or 15 minutes of class where I would use these rather than writing on the board. And then I would shift to the board and do the remainder of the class in a much more interactive fashion. OK, so you speed up the lecture and leave more time. The recordings that I've already done, I would leave them up so that students who either could miss, who missed the lecture or who want, would like to see them again have access to them. My office hours will be online. Now, the future, what can we do before? I think the big opportunity for online is going to be graduate and professional courses. Now, Susan in her, Susan McCann in her keynote lecture talked about this whole idea of having you know, these continuing education. I think that is going to be a huge opportunity for us. Now, one thing is our graduate classes, we should certainly be offering them across universities. I don't know how many people there are who are still old enough to remember, but about 20 years ago, we tried this, where Waterloo, Toronto, McMaster got together. We even set up rooms with video cameras and so on. It didn't work out because we didn't really have the technology. Now we do. For professional education, we certainly should do it. We can offer courses on specialized topics. We can get multiple instructors. And we can market this around the world. This is an opportunity which I think somebody will do. And I think we should certainly be doing this. OK, let me stop over there and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have.
So Sanji, yeah, if if I may. Uh, so um, I, uh, as you may remember, I teach uh, graduate courses, mm -hmm. um, one a term now, uh, and of course I converted them all, uh, especially with uh, after talking to you, you helped me quite a bit. Unfortunately, it was uh, halfway through my uh, journey of converting all my classes online. Uh, because I hadn't realized I could use PowerPoint to narrate uh, and generate the uh, video until after I talked to you. But I've come to a, a very different conclusion, I think, than you. Mm -hmm. uh, so my students have told me that they find the freedom of being able to have the lectures pre-recorded uh, and all of the basically data dump uh, that I would do with my slide work uh, much more effective for them being able to do it whenever they needed to. Uh, in one of my courses, I gave them a quiz, an online quiz, asking them question a question about the video they were supposed to watch before class. Mm -hmm. And I gave them an extra mark for simply answering. In fact, <laughs> really, you know, you could you could guess the answer even if you didn't watch the video. But uh, it resulted in students are mark hounds, no matter how mature they are. Yeah. And uh, in they always watch the videos. Mm -hmm. I tried with another course. I didn't give them an incentive to watch the videos. And so my performance was more like what you're reporting. About half of them watch the videos. But in the case where I gave them an extra mark, they all watch the videos and they all watch them in advance all the way through the course. OK, so there's there's that. The second thing is I turned all of my synchronous scheduled classes into professor's hours in which I would spend a few minutes at the beginning of class highlighting what I thought was important in the lecture. And then everything was about their assignments, either they were making presentations or discussion for their questions. So in other words, what used to be 10 percent of my class would be devoted to what they were interested in, and 90% was me transmitting slideware and you know data to them, has now been turned around to 90% of it is what they're interested in, okay? And this has changed the complexion of my teaching. I've been teaching since 1969, okay? So prob lo probably longer <laughs> than, than most people <laughs> have been working. Uh, and yeah. this has completely changed the dynamics of not only what they're learning, but what I'm learning and also our mutual enjoyment. OK, I'm getting performance results from my feedback from my students like I haven't gotten in years. Yeah. OK, they're, they really like this. It gives so, them control. Yeah, now I, I certainly appreciate what you're saying. One of the complications I think this year was that a lot of our students were physically not here. And so, you know, I thought about the same thing about giving marks for participation and yeah. so on. What made me stop doing that is that something like, I think about 10 to 15 percent of the class is in different time zones. Yes, yes. And Agreed. that made me hesitate because I would be penalizing students who, you know, literally couldn't make it physically. No, no, no. I gave them to the end of the day of the actual live lecture of okay. a live class, which I also recorded and posted. So there yeah. was never, there's no, I, of course, I recognize that the, the time constraint, I removed the time constraint. This is all just about getting everybody on the same page. And as you report, the same thing I found was the most important uh, thing that's lacking from our the online model that we've applied is that the students can't be together. Yeah. OK, and so we have we have to do whatever we whatever we plan to do. And I'm planning to teach in person and online simultaneously uh, as long as I continue teaching. So when I'm in the classroom in person, I'll physically be online as well. And in person with the students who choose or can come in cl into class and online with the ones who can't uh, or don't want to. OK, and, and one of my classes now, I'm going to turn my fall class into a purely asynchronous course. 
where the, still having synchronous classes, which are totally optional, that they do not have to attend, which are going to be devoted only to them and what they're interested in. Yeah. Okay, and then of course recorded as well. So I'm still experimenting with all of this, but the students are the ones who are going to help us figure out how to yeah. do this the best way possible. And it's the first time I know, look, I've been teaching for what's 50 to 52 years. I can hardly believe it. Yeah. And I thought that I was doing what was best for them before, but I didn't have the means of understanding what they were telling me, okay? And, or means of listening to them the way COVID has perked up my ears, yeah. okay? It's, it's changed the way I see everything about learning, yeah. okay? And now that I think we've empowered, our students are empowered. This is the important thing. Yeah, anyway, sure. that's enough for me. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't know if there are any more questions. We have another hand raised from uh, uh, Jason. Mm -hmm. Hi, Sanjeev. Yeah. I, I just wanted to, you mentioned something and I just wanted to highlight because that's been my experience too, where one of the one of the kind of hidden dangers of going online with a course is what you mentioned about just assuming that students will magically have time to watch these extra videos, yeah. right? So if, if, you know, if, you're, if your class is normally three hours and then you give them two hours of videos or an hour and a half of videos to watch, and then you expect them to come for the, uh, for the, the, you know, the, the lectures, that's yeah. very easy to slip into because we we're so centered around our own course. But if everyone does that, then suddenly you're doubling or whatever, doubling the time that they're on task. And yeah. And I think they have to be very conscious of that, that, you know, our students already are under a lot of time pressures and we have to be reasonable in what we expect of them. Yeah. So, so that that's why you know the flip classroom sounds great in theory. And I, I thought it was a wonderful idea. I still think it's a wonderful idea, but I I think we have to be realistic about what we can expect from them. Yeah. Okay. If there any more questions? Yeah, we have a hand raised from Eduardo. Yes. Go ahead. What, what platform do you use it? And also, if you have a, like a in case of broken down communication, you have a backup. Do you see another yeah. platform? So uh, the platform was on BB Collaborate. I didn't try and get more elaborate than that. BB Collaborate is okay. It's, you know, as everyone's experience, it's not the greatest. Uh, I didn't really have a lot of technical difficulties. I probably over the year, I think there might have been once or two times when I had serious communication issues. But most of the time, it seemed to work reasonably well. Uh, my biggest problem with BB Collaborate is that if you want to write, and you know, I'd like to sort of write down, I write on a, I, I wrote on an iPad and connected that, and there's no easy way to do that on BB Collaborate. It's a very clunky, you have lots of things connected to lots of other things, which is just asking for trouble. So, I mean, if there's one thing I would wish for BB Collaborate is that there was a better way of actually just handwriting on it, but it's feasible. But by and large, it wasn't that big of issue. I, I think we managed reasonably well. I mean, do you, in the beginning, in the first class, uh, going virtual, do you have the first session, uh, all the time the support of the technical people watching or are available for you in case of any problem? No, I didn't. I, I think we had sort of over the summer, I think we had sort of practiced enough over the summer, and I, I was reasonably confident. It, it wasn't clear to me that even you know if I had problems, whether technical support really could have helped me very much, because the problem usually would be at my end, you know, with the computer and so on. So I, I'm not sure that that really would have helped a lot. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Chandra. Um, the uh, official um, scheduled time has passed for this session, and uh, uh, just a reminder.